Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See detail. Today on CityCast Philly. Time is running out before SEPTA makes drastic cuts to service or raises fares to deal with the fact that state Republicans have held up funding that the transit agency says it needs to survive. Democratic State Representative Ben Waxman represents Center City and parts of South Philly in the state legislature. He's here to talk to me about funding SEPTA, possible cuts, and how Philly can get its fair share from Harrisburg. It's Wednesday, October 23rd. I'm Trinae Nuri, and here's what Philly's talking about. Representative Ben Waxman, thanks for being on CityCast Philly. Thank you so much for having me. That was a great intro. (laughs) Thank you. Representative Waxman, your profile pic on X is of you on SEPTA's Broad Street line. So it's safe to say that this issue of SEPTA's funding is really important to you. Yeah, I've been taking SEPTA, I think, since I was 11 or 12 years old, basically, you know, as young as I was, whatever, my parents said that that was, that was okay. And I represent really one of the densest and most urban districts in the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And my constituents really rely on SEPTA to get around not just the district, but the whole city um, right. as much as anybody does. And, and so it's a very, very important issue to, to me and I think to the whole city, um, you know, having a, a mass transit system that works um, and is reliable and comes regularly um, and is safe. I think those are all things that people all over the city want. And in particular, you know, for people in my district to rely on SEPTA, it's definitely an issue that's at the top of their mind. Right. People needed to go to work, school, doctor's appointments, Eagles games. It's essential to life here in the city. And it's the largest in the state. It feels like this is a dire situation that like Harrisburg doesn't care about it. Or is that true? Well, I think that I definitely want to underline what you just said about it being a, a dire situation. And, you know, unfortunately, there is no, at this time, you know, dedicated funding for mass transit that is a part of our state budget. It is, uh, uh, we're relying on getting the funding every year. Um, You know, we've had a a big drop off in riders during the pandemic that is now starting to come back. But that coupled with the lack of a dedicated state funding formula for mass transit, what we have now is a very, very serious situation where we're talking about, you know, both not just fair hikes uh, or cuts, but really we're talking about both. We have not really seen anything from SEPTA where they have outlined specifically what it would mean. I think they're trying to hold off from doing that at this time. But the numbers that they have said, if we can't get the funding that we need from Harrisburg, we're talking about a 20 to 30 percent cut um, in the system. And so what we did in my office was we took a look Um, you know, what public information is available, but also, you know, previous proposed budget cuts to SEPTA that have happened even over the past decade. And by looking at those, you know, pieces of information, we were able to cobble together what it really might mean for us to have 30% of SEPTA services cut, um, as well as big fare increases. For example, you know, 10 years ago when they were looking at budget cuts, one of the things they came up with to fill the budget hole that was of a similar size was basically eliminating all subway service to South Philadelphia. All subway service on the Broad Street line to South (laughs) Philadelphia. That doesn't even make sense. (laughs) Cutting it off basically at Walnut Locust. Um, Mm. And so then maybe having Express that could run to the sports stadiums from Center City, but that all of the local stops could possibly be eliminated um, in, in order to to get uh, the, the system to be able to beat the shortfall. Um, we have looked at scenarios of what may happen with regional rail uh, lines. There are some conversations right now about cutting regional rail lines um, and eliminating at least one. And that's meeting, you know, pretty severe resistance from the communities that that line serves. But our analysis says that if we wind up with a 20 to 30 percent cut 
in our in our SEPTA operating budget, we're going to have to eliminate up to two different regional rail lines in order to make that work and make the numbers work. So we're not just even talking about what is very controversial and being discussed now in terms of regional rail. We're literally talking about two entire lines possibly you know, being eliminated and what that might mean, you know, for the neighborhoods that are serviced by those things, but also, you know, the suburban communities that rely on regional rail to get in and out of the city. Um, the last one that I'll that I'll just mention, because I think it's the final leg of the system is our bus services, right? Um, you know, take Route 21, the Route 21 bus right now, which is kind of like a workhorse of the entire system. It goes from my district um, in Center City you know, all the way um, through commercial corridors, like downtown. It's a really, really important route. Um, right now, riders are already waiting up to 15 minutes per bus. And mm-hmm. and so what we think would happen if you had the level of cuts that are required under what would be except to talk about having to be necessary, we could go from 15 to 20 to 30 up to an hour between buses in terms of coming. Um, so I, I say all of this because I think that it's very, very important to raise the alarm at this point. We're really talking about catastrophic changes uh, to the system that would really, really impact just the level of service that people who ride the system, many of whom, quite frankly, feel that it isn't very good right now, right? But we are talking about really apocalyptic stuff here if we don't get the money that we need uh, out of the state capital for our transit system. Can you give us a bit of a history lesson here? How did we get to this point where SEPTA is $240 million in the hole and now we're facing a fare hike and possible service cuts? Yeah, I think that it's a combination of two factors. I mean, the big thing is obviously the pandemic had a tremendous impact on transit. You know, many of the systems remained running but they were not being utilized obviously by a lot of people. There were, you know, uh, that plus the combination of just the fact that we have more and more people working from home. They used to commute five days a week into the city. Now they commute one, two, three days a week, and they're still, you know, taking the train, but they are not taking the train every day. And so as a result, fares and ridership decreased. And at the same time, there was federal pandemic help that existed for SEPTA and other transit agencies that was, you know, provided during this period. And that funding has run out. And we are still not in a place where ridership has recovered to the point that it can make up for the revenue that has been lost. Um, So I think that is the primary reason that we're looking at of why we've seen an issue with the with SEPTA's funding. So that's the short term thing that created the current crisis. In a long-term sense, as I kind of mentioned, we have not had a dedicated line item in the state budget for mass transit. Um, And that means that every budget cycle, you know, there's another round of negotiations that have to take place in order to secure the funding. Um, And so because there is no line item, that it isn't a built-in part of the budget that has, and there's no dedicated funding source for transit in the state budget, That has meant that we historically have had a lot less funding from the state than, you know, we have needed in order to keep our transit system going. December 1st is when SEPTA starts to increase fares. So fares are going to jump 25 percent from two dollars to two fifty for riders who use their debit or credit cards or their SEPTA key card. Representative Waxman, can you help me here with the math? (laughs) How much does SEPTA need to avoid fare increases or service cuts? And is the fare increase definitely happening? Well, I don't work for SEPTA. I don't have, I'm not on the SEPTA board. I have no um, direct like control or management of SEPTA. And I think that's just important because I'm speaking for myself and I'm speaking kind of like what I think is going to happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I do not see a scenario at this time where we do not have a fair increase of some kind on December 1st. And I do not see a scenario right now where we don't have some very, very dramatic, potentially short term, but still dramatic cuts in service to the system. And that is because we are in a place now where while the governor, our governor, Josh Shapiro, who is from Southeast Pennsylvania, he has been vocal in his support for transit funding we in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives have on a bipartisan basis have passed 
funding bills out of our chamber and sent them to the Senate. Um, but as you alluded to in your initial uh, intro, there were Senate Republicans who do not have constituencies that rely on transit the way that we do, have refused to take up a funding bill. Okay. And we are now looking at what looks to be the final week that the legislature will be in session before the election. Um, and really before the end of the year are, are we, you know, we may have some lame duck days that may happen, but at this point, if anything is going to happen legislatively, it's supposed to happen this week. While we've sent things over to the chamber, I see no sign that the Senate is going to take this up or is going to deal with this um, in, in any kind of way that's going to be rapid enough to keep some pretty dramatic cuts from happening to SEPTA. It, it's in a really, really, really unfortunate situation, but I want to be real with people about what I think is about to happen. What don't Senate Republicans get about the role that SEPTA plays in our lives here every yeah. day and in our economy? Yeah, I, I mean, and the fact that the entire state's economy runs off of Southeast PA. There is no Pennsylvania economy without Philadelphia and the college suburbs. It's where all of the economic activity is, um, and it's where the jobs are and, and, and everything that, you, you know, in this, in this region. Um, I think there is, this is a little bit of a complex answer, but what is going on in the Republican caucus in the Senate, from what I can tell, is that they can't get their act together to do anything. Okay. And the reason, and you look at a number of big priorities, things that we thought were going to move, not to me as important as SEPTA, but other bills, other large pieces of legislation, they also have not moved. And the reason that they haven't moved is because from what I can tell, there's, they have about 10 to 12 members who are just no's on everything. They're against government spending. They're against the budget. They're against school funding. They're against raising the minimum wage. They're against, um, you know, we're trying to move a bill to increase protections for the LGBTQ plus community to protect people from hate crimes and discrimination. They don't want to move that stuff. I mean, they have a chunk of people who are this very extreme, very far right ideology. And SEPTA to them is a welfare program. I've heard people say that on the like. I've heard their members say that, um, that they that they just it's almost like they're reflexively against anything that they think is something that's for Philadelphia. Um, but the other way that it works, to be honest, in the legislature is it's not so much about that they have to be in favor of transit funding. At the end of the day, they don't really care. They don't really care what happens in Philadelphia. They don't really care what happens to the SEPTA system. It, it just isn't something they're concerned about. What they're concerned about is what can they trade us for SEPTA funding? What are they willing to put on the table to say, we want this? And they aren't able to do that because their people won't say yes to anything, no matter what it is, right? Um, and to me, from where I'm sitting, that seems to be the biggest block of anything is that the Senate Republican caucus is dysfunctional and can't get their act together to offer anything up. And so they don't act. And so we have, a, have all of these things where we've reached a bottleneck and the SEPTA funding is, is a victim of that. So when it comes to a big issue like SEPTA and SEPTA funding, it's not so much that we have to convince them that they should you know, do the right thing and they're gonna do it out of the goodness of their hearts. It's about, do they have something that they can trade, something that they want in exchange you know, for SEPTA funding. That is the way that the legislature works, especially when you have a divided chamber. Have they said anything? The, so there were conversations about that they might want to uh, legalize skill games, which are basically like these mini slot machines that are starting mm -hmm. to pop up in convenience stores. Right now they're in a legal gray area. And there was some conversation over the summer that they would be willing to trade legalizing those because they have, they have senators that want that in exchange for SEPTA. And it seemed like something while there were concerns of the, those of us in Philadelphia about those machines and how it might work, there was an openness to have a conversation and do something if this was the priority that they were gonna identify. They couldn't get it together to get the votes. They couldn't get it out of their chamber because they have a big chunk of their members that just say no to everything. And this is one of the things that they said no to. More on funding needed for SEPTA after the break.
we talked a little bit about Governor Josh Shapiro. Um, he is a Democrat from the Philly Burbs. He understands the way people rely on SEPTA here, right? So what did he do to try to get this funding? Well, I see the governor definitely as one of the heroes of the story, without a doubt. I mean, once the financial issues began to um, become, you know, more and more pressing with SEPTA and some of the issues with ridership that we talked about in the st stimulus funding, you did see the governor's office kind of uh, leap into action pretty quickly. And in particular, put SEPTA funding as a major component of his proposed budget that he put out. Now, as a result of what happened in negotiations, we didn't get the full what the governor had proposed, but you almost never get that um, uh, in any issue. Um, but you did wind up being able to have, with the work of the Philadelphia delegation and with the governor, secure, I think, between 70 and $80 million in funding for SEPTA that starved off sort of the worst of the budget cuts. And then over the summer, you had a very active, uh, vocal sort of, you know, social media presence and, and also hearings all over the state that we did with their administration participated in, um, in a real effort to try to build support and have it be something that we could come back in the fall and really take a whack at. So the governor's been very, very vocal. Um, we have two parties between the state house and the governor who are ready to do this and are ready to act and are on board. Um, and it's just that third party that we're waiting for. So I think the governor, and like you said, the governor's from Southeast Pennsylvania. He's no stranger to SEPTA and to the SEPTA system. And so I think he understands the importance of it. You called the governor a hero on this issue, but I've heard criticism that he didn't use the political leverage he might have had earlier this year. Is there anything he could do or should do now about this? Right. I think that, you know, the governor is going to have to look at all of the different options that are available if the legislature fails. That's the first thing. I think that if we don't get something done in these last couple of weeks, um, then we really need to come back during the budget process uh, next time around when we come back in June and uh, try to sort of stave off what may be short-term cuts, but then try to push again to get dedicated funding as part of the budget and make that uh, continue to make that a priority. Um, I guess I do want to push back, though, a little bit on some of this criticism. I've definitely, you know, seen some of it. And I, I just don't think, I mean, there, there's no magic wand that the governor has that he can wave to make the Senate Republicans do anything. Um, if that magic wand existed, we'd have a higher minimum wage. You know, we'd have, uh, you know, Roe v. Wade codified by law. Um, we'd have a, um, you know, we'd have protections for LGBTQ plus community in, 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 our, in our civil code and, and in all the other places that we're trying to get. I mean, I can make you a long list of things that are very, very important, that are top priorities of the governor that have stalled because of the same thing that's at play with the, with the, with the SEPTA. And so when people say you should have done, you know, there, there, you should have, there should be more influence, you should be able to make this done. I'm always like, how? You know, you know let me know. Um, because we are running into a wall over and over again, at least from a legislative perspective. And, you know, it's, it's, he, the governor can only sign a bill that gets to his desk and can only, that can only happen if it comes to the floor and there's a vote on it. Um, and, and so I hear people's frustration. I know that people wish that more could be done. But if you really look at all the things that are stalled, um, you know, we're in definitely a log jam here in the Capitol on a lot of important issues. Republican Senator Joe Pittman from the western part of the state is the majority leader in the state Senate. He said recently that the problem with SEPTA funding is that the decision on transit needs to include a discussion on infrastructure. And that's not happening here. What do you make of that argument? Well, one, I would say that we, myself included, have, you know, have made clear that we're willing to vote for money for roads and bridges. I mean, I'm not going to say no to rural and suburban transportation goals, even if they might not be my own, if it means that we can get the money that we need for SEPTA. And so, you know, there's a willingness on our side to have that conversation. There's a willingness to do something on it and to do something to make sure that, you know, his caucus gets what they need in terms of that funding so that we can keep SEPTA from completely collapsing. 
Um, so, you know, I'm not sure where the lack of willingness is that he's seeing. I would also point to a series of hearings that the transportation, the House Majority Transportation Committee did under Ed Nielsen's leadership all over the Commonwealth, not over the summer and then in the fall, that talked about transit, it talked about highways, it talked about roads, and it talked about bridges, it talked about everything, um, a comprehensive approach. So I think that that is, is clearly something that we you know, would be willing to support. And so I would question you know, how serious of a comment that is. You talked about it throughout our conversation. You know, does this issue expose larger problems with policymaking in the state, like particularly when it comes to the state Senate controlled by Republicans and state House controlled barely by Democrats? What does it take to make these policy deals happen in Harrisburg these days? Yeah, I think that one, it's that it's slow uh, moving. What does it take? It takes time. And then two, they seem to mostly be small things. And that, you know, with the exception of some parts of the budget that had to do with education funding that I thought were pretty big deals, we're going to be about the small ball up here in Harrisburg for a while, because that's the kind of stuff that can get through both chambers. And so that is good if you like bipartisan, you know, don't want either party to go too far too fast. Um, You know, but the problem is, is that we need to hit a home run. And that's what we need to do on transit funding. It's very, very difficult for us to get it together to do it. Um, so I think I think that is, you, you know, the first thing. The second thing is my saying to everyone is, you know, most things are tied to the budget. The budget is the real period when things can get done up here is when we're going through our budget process and we're trying to approve a budget. And that's where you can get big things done and a lot of small things. And so I think that I believe that for us to really take a really – good whack at this and to maybe have a chance to make real progress on it, I think we're going to have to do it and come back as part of the budget process for in you know the, the, both the, the spring and then part of the fall. I think there's no other way that this gets done in any kind of serious way. Representative Weissman, you have a really interesting background. Several years ago, you were a journalist at the Daily News and WHYY, like I was. There's another former journalist at the State House in Harrisburg, Liz Fiedler. What is it like being on the other side of things as a legislator facing questions from reporters and journalists like me? Well, I did. But in between getting elected and being a journalist, I was in PR. So I would like to think that I am somewhat able to answer questions from journalists. Okay, you've got the um, whole spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and uh, no, I mean, it is it is really interesting. And I think the difference is, is that one of the big differences is like journalists have to think about communicating to a pretty broad audience. They have to think about communicating to people that are not going to know anything about the story before they first pick up the paper or listen to it on the radio. We in politics could benefit a lot from that more and like remembering that not everyone is totally immersed every day in the nuances of every single issue and that you have right. to kind of start and meet people where you're at. So I think about that a lot. I try to have that that training. And the, the other thing that I'll just say that to me, and this isn't something specifically, um, you know, I, I, I guess it, it's funny to me because the number of times I have people, I hear people shoot down bad ideas among lawmakers or politicians or whatever, because, hey, that might wind up in the paper. I don't know if that's a great idea. Um, that reminds me every time that the importance of journalism and the importance of like freedom of speech and freedom of the press towards just like holding power accountable, but like also like scaring power a little bit. Like it's not just about um, the stories that journalists do. It's the mere presence of a free and open press that is a check on power and encourages people to behave better. And um, so it's just a really important, important job. And uh, it was a fun job too. So one more question before I let you go. And it has to deal with the big day. We're just about two weeks away from the election. What's your level of confidence that your party is going to be able to retain the White House? And we talked about on the show just about like criticism that the Harris campaign isn't doing enough to coordinate with local Philly Democrats to get out the vote. So what are you seeing out there? So I'll say I'm seeing a tremendous, tremendous level of energy and enthusiasm. Um, there's just events everywhere. I think that there's a, a incredible energy behind the nominee. I think that, you know, 
the change, obviously, in who was the nominee, I think was the right thing for the president to step aside and allow the VP to come in. I think that we're seeing every day that that was the right choice in terms of the energy and enthusiasm. You know, we have great operatives in in Philly and and great political people who who know how to get out the vote. So I, I you know, I, I every every I've been involved in a lot of campaigns. Things go things get messed up. Things go badly. You know, <laughs> events go poorly. Um, the, these things all happen. Uh, but I don't see anything out of usual with this presidential campaign than any other presidential campaign that I've seen or been involved in, really. State Representative Ben Waxman, thanks for being on CityCast Philly, and I hope you come back to the show. Okay, very nice to talk to you and very nice to meet you. We reached out to a spokesperson for the state Senate Republicans to get a comment about the failure to approve funding for SEPTA, but we didn't hear back. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. If you enjoyed this episode about the funding needed for SEPTA, tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and hit that subscribe button. Be sure to sign up for our morning newsletter, Hey Philly, to learn more about what else Philly's talking about. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye. Bye.